that in mind because the vision came to her from her mother. Celebrated differently in different places in the country, but it's a holiday that we re recognize and pay honor to the mothers that God has given us. And I know that's tough for some people because some people's mothers aren't worthy of honor. Neither is your enemy worthy of your love, but Jesus teaches that. Because all people are created in God's image, it is God's will that all men be saved. You were a sinner when Christ died for you. You have no more right to eternal life than anyone else. But by faith, you are saved by God's grace. It is a gift. You deserve eternal punishment. And you should be so excited that you have life and that Jesus gave convincing proofs that he was the son of God. And he rose again and then continued to teach and show them that he was alive. And he taught us how to live as children of the kingdom. And women, whether you're a mother or not, don't think that you don't play that role or you're any less than because you are created fully and equally in the image of God. And you have a lot of attributes of God that we as men do not have. We are incomplete without you if you want to look at Scripture. For my restart, she started her campaign in 1905, Ann Jarvis did, when her mother passed, and then held the memorial in 1907 and 1908. Carnations were a part of that. I, don't, I haven't seen that here. Sherry says it's a southern thing, but I remember growing up and into, into teenage years where we wore car, carnations to church. I remember giving corsages to my mother and stuff too. But a red carnation uh, symbolized that your mother was alive and a white carnation said that she was deceased. I just wore a red shirt. My mom is alive and I thank God for her today. It's because of her that I attended Christian school growing up and everything. She took a job working for the state where she worked for 40 years or more so that I could go to Christian school. That was what she wanted. And my dad was there, and he taught me plenty of things, but he taught me more about business. My mom was the one that was there by my bed doing the chores and praying over me. So I thank God for my mother. Um, in 1908, Congress rejected the proposal for Mother's Day and joked, well, if we do it, we'll have to set aside a mother-in-law day. By 1911, though, there were, pe there were certain areas of the country recognizing a Mother's Day. And in 1914 was when Woodrow Wilson made it an official holiday in the United States. And it has grown to over 40 countries now. But, that but word, by the 1920s the holiday was being commercialized. Can you imagine that? For profit and greed and everything else. It wasn't really what her mother intended, and it has kind of become like Valentine's Day. You ask Sherry if she wants something for Valentine's Day, she's, no, that day is not special at all. Give me something on another day, because on that day, you're supposed to do it. You know, it means nothing. She wanted, her mother wanted a holiday that would, not necessarily a holiday, a day that would honor women where women could be trained to be a better mother. Wow. Wow. Not just to recognize them for the mother they are, but for other mothers and other people to help them because of the responsibility that mothers have, which is so huge. And just like I said earlier, you have God-given talents and abilities, fruits of the Spirit that we don't get as men. And you can come alongside and raise your children with your husband much more efficiently it is God's will and design. And if you don't believe me, we'll go back to Genesis, but I'm not planning on going there today because God created man and woman in his image and then he left man alone so that man would recognize that he needed that helpmate to walk through this world. Now, that was before sin and the ability to have children was then. So man and woman were designed to worship God and raise their children to worship God. Simple as I can put it, before the fall of, of mankind. That is God's plan, that he would have a relationship with us and we would have a relationship with others. I'll probably do this a lot today because that's exactly what Jesus Christ did to mend that broken relationship. So I've got some more, a little bit of information. According to Time Magazine, which is where that video clip was from, 
1876, Anne heard her mother recite the following prayer after teaching a Sunday school lesson. One little thing, you don't know what matters. She said, I hope and pray that someone sometime will find a memorial Mother's Day commemorating her for the matchless service she renders to humanity in every field of life. When her mother died in 1905, she vowed to fulfill that dream. But what the elder Jarvis had probably had in mind was something different than what her daughter eventually brought to reality. Evidence suggests that the original idea was for a Mother's Day, a day for mothers, plural, not a day for one's own mother, on which mothers would get together for a day of service to help out other mothers who were less fortunate than they were. The reason was a tragic one. Her experience as motherhood had been infused with sadness. Of the 13 children that she bore, only four lived to adulthood. Her story was not uncommon. An estimated 15 to 30 percent of infants in the Appalachian region died before their first birthday throughout the 19th and 20th century, largely due to academics that were spread by poor sanitary conditions. In 1858, while she was pregnant for the sixth time, Jarvis enlisted the help of uh, her brother, Dr. James Reeves, who was involved in treating victims of the typhoid fever ec epidemic. To try to improve the situation, they organized events at which doctors were invited to lead discussions with local mothers on the latest hygiene practice that could keep their children healthy. They called these events Mother's Day Work Clubs. Anne recognized the power and responsibility of mothers, and it came from something that happened at church. God-given abilities to a mother to raise and instill in her daughter a responsibility to be a good parent and hopefully seeing that the church part was in there to to give reverent fear to the Lord and worship him more of this uh, article says in any case when it comes to championing the idea Jarvis proved that she definitely deserved the credit her advertising background probably helped uh, by 1912 she had quit her job in the industry and started Mother's Day International Association Partnerships with florists and a successful letter-writing campaign to state governors helped the holiday get recognized at the state and eventually federal level. According to Today.com, Jarvis died, died at 84, alone and penniless, from the various legal battles that she waged over the holiday that she started. She never made any profit from Mother's Day, and she never had any children. Look at the irony in that story but God is in complete control. According to time.com, she was fighting with other people for full credit, which is what started her uh, uh, eventual sp spiral downhill, led, leading her to be broke, blind, and end up in a sanitarium. She died in 1948, though, and was buried next to her mother. God is in complete control he will work everything out. And if you believe in Jesus Christ, put your faith in Him, you will have eternal life. And no one can take that away from you. Now everyone here, everyone here, has had the privilege of being born. <laughs> right? That means you had a mother. She might not have been a mother to you. You might not have called her mother. But God blessed you and gave you life through a mother. It is His plan. He wants a relationship with you, and you are to have a relationship with others, even your enemy, even if that was your mother. And you are to live such a life that when people see how you live differently, they ask you about the hope that you have. Most of you ladies today here have experienced motherhood also, so you've had that privilege. It is a gift, a duty, a responsibility, a blessing from God, designed before sin ever came into creation. Last week I told the men how God had created them to rule over, it says in Genesis, mankind to rule over this creation, to lead their families, to be thankful, to be reverent and holy in worship, to fear God, to train up their children to this holy standard which they can't keep. Right? But praise be to God that Jesus Christ could, that Jesus Christ did. And that you now don't have the Ark of the Covenant. We looked at a video about covenants that it shows God's presence. 
and leads the people. You have the Holy Spirit. You have God Himself leading and guiding you. The pattern is still the same. Men are supposed to lead their families. Wives are supposed to be the helpmate that completes them. And we're supposed to raise our children so that they raise their children and their children's children to love and fear God. And then we are to go out to the world and live such a life that people will see a difference in us and ask us why. Why do we have this hope? In Genesis 1, 27 and 28, we will read, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Being a father and being a mother. To fill the earth and to subdue it. To rule over the fish of the seas and the birds of the air and every creature that crawls upon the earth. A holy standard that God had in communion with Him to raise families. So I'm going to stop here for just a second and ask you how mothers are you raising your children? Just because they're out of your house doesn't mean you're not still raising them, doesn't mean they're not looking. You saw what from this article that it was just a few years before Anne's mother died that something that her mother said inspired her to go do this. And Anne still didn't have the privilege of having children herself and left this world broke and penniless, but was buried beside of her mother. Wow. You have been so blessed with the ability to be a mother. Jesus wouldn't even be here if he didn't have a mother. In Genesis 2.24, I said we weren't going to go there, but I'm going to go with a couple of verses. We read, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, mother to mother to mother. Without mothers, there would be, we would not be here today. Without mothers, like I said, we wouldn't have Jesus. It was God's plan for mothers. Don't you ever take that responsibility lightly. Do you, don't you ever think that God is not there with you every minute of the day? Do, don't you ever think that God will not answer your prayers? He loves you so much and you play such a vital role in humanity. From last week's scriptures in Exodus 34, guys, I hope you remember some of these. Starting in verse 5, Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord, and he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and for, uh, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children's children for the sin of the parents. Guys, last week I pointed that scripture at you. This week I'm pointing that scripture at you ladies as the mothers. We both have a responsibility. We have a responsibility as one as parents to raise our children to fear, love, honor, and worship God for His greatness, for what He has done. And in the Old Testament, there was just the foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. You know the passion of Jesus Christ. In Deuteronomy 30, verses 14 to 20, which we also went over, no, the word is very near to you. No is a response to what we read previous to that. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you may obey it. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to Him, and to keep His commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you enter to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship to them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call heavens and earth as witness against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Now choose life. What's next? You remember, guys? So that... So tying it together, your children may live. I know all of you have had heartaches as far as being a parent, the ones that are parents. Mothers more so, like I said, than fathers. Guys can get that tough skin and everything else, and mothers let their hearts flow out. 
but God is faithful. He is the God of the impossible. Do not lose your faith. Do not let it be watered down and deceived by the devil. Pray for your kids. Love your kids. Love your husband. Honor and respect and love God. Follow His commands. And it's written in your hearts. God lives inside of you. Verse 20, And that you may love the Lord your God, listen to His voice, and hold fast to Him. For the Lord is your life. And he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now fast forwarding to the New Testament in Luke 23. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him, because they have more heart and more compassion than most of you guys. Sorry. It's the way they're created. It's the way you women are created. You pour out your heart. That's the way it's designed by God. Don't stop loving and pouring out your heart to us guys and to your family. You are filled with love because God has filled you with love. Then they wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourself and for your children. For the time will come when you say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore, and breasts that never nursed. Pray for your children. Verse 30, Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. Mothers, you have such a responsibility in this world. Don't take it lightly. Being a mother, in my terms, is probably the biggest blessing that God gave mankind. I mean, He blessed man with woman, showed us that, it, that we couldn't do it on our own. We needed that. And there's so many more blessings He put in there. But there would be no heritage that came from the Lord without the, the blessing of motherhood. And like I said earlier, I am so thankful for the mother that I've had, and I'm so thankful for the wife that I have that is a mother now. So I want to look at an example from Scripture. You'll find her name three different ways in the Bible. You'll find it S-A-R-A-I, you'll find it S-A-R-A-H, and you'll find it S-A-R-A in the New Testament also. The first word means... I'm going to pronounce them all Sarah, okay? Instead of Sarah, I'm just going to go with Sarah. means princess. I don't know if you know that or not. It's recorded 17 times. Do you know what the S-A-R-A-H means? Noble woman. <laughs> you ladies are princesses of the Most High. Sherry's uh, license plate says she is the princess of the King of Kings. And when she had a child, she became a noble woman woman because that is the blessing that God gave her as a mother you are princesses the kingdom belongs to you the kingdom is here repent we are to usher in the kingdom we are to live as as children of the kingdom of, the, of heaven not the kingdom of this world and when Sarah had Isaac she became a noble woman I don't know if that's when she realized it or not. In Hebrews, where we read from chapter 12 and Hebrew 11, she's in that hall of faith. And when I look back at Sarah, I don't think of her as having great faith. But she's recognized for it. Because ladies, guys too, but later, God can build your faith. All you need is a mustard seed grain of faith. And He can grow it into something mighty. It's also recorded in the New Testament. Two times when Paul is talking about those of Abraham's faith. And the ones that Sarah conceived. Abraham being the father of the faith, but without Sarah, we wouldn't have any of the children to, to, to have there. One time by Peter, when he's explaining the living hope that we have, the priesthood that we belong to, that, that we are, the building that we're building upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. And he writes for children to be submissive. And then he writes that part about wives, be submissive to your husbands. 
Okay? Okay, we got all that? And then right, well, I'll start with that verse. Why not? I always like to have trouble. 1 Peter 3, verse 1. Wives, in the same way, this is after you've submitted to the government authorities of this world and so forth, and you've lived your life in such a way that, like I said, that others see that you're different. Wives, you live differently. Submit yourself to your husband, even though he thinks you're property in this time. You have no rights whatsoever. Submit yourself to your husbands so that... Even if they refuse to believe the word, they will be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. See the importance that you have in living a life that honors God to bringing your husband to a holy standard. Verse 2, when they see your pure and reverent demeanor. Verse 3, your beauty should not come from outward adorn adornment such as braided hair or gold or jewelry or fine clothes, but from the inner disposition of your heart where those words of God are written upon your heart. The unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is, a precious, which is precious in God's sight. That gentle and quiet spirit isn't a definition that I found in Scripture anywhere giving of a, a man, a male. I find it given to the woman. Verse 5, For this is how the holy woman of the past adorned themselves. They put their hope in God, were submissive to their husband, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham and called him Lord. And you are her children if you do what is right and refuse to give away to fear. That fear again. The fear that God isn't big enough to handle your problems. To, to fear putting your heart out there because you're afraid to get hurt again. To fear failure. To fear be dying alone and penniless. Whatever those fears are, God is so much bigger than all of those fears. And God has made a promise to you, ladies. A promise to us as Christians. And God is big enough to take care and handle His promises. The Old Testament tells us over and over. Even when we're stiff-necked, rebellious, and lack faith, He is faithful and just. And Jesus Christ died for our sins. The penalty has been paid for our sins. You don't fall to the penalty or the power of sin. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you as long as you'll let the Holy Spirit guide you. Jesus said this before that His sacrifice, and I'm sure that He went over it again in those 40 days afterwards. In Luke 17, 1 to 6, Jesus said to his disciples, It is inevitable that stumbling blocks will come, but woe to the one through whom they come. So don't especially let that be you, mothers. It would be better for him to have a millstone hung around his neck and be thrown into the sea than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. Even if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times returns to say, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. There is nothing wrong with that. It is admirable. And the Lord answered, If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, then you can say to the mulberry tree, Be rooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. I'm sure that I can say, mothers, that most of you have some heartache that you question in your life, why? And you think it's too big. Give it to God today. It's not too big for Him. I don't know what it is. It doesn't matter. You don't have to tell it to anyone else, but give it to Jesus. Let Him take that burden away from you and let Him handle it. And you may see it in this lifetime. You may not. But I promise you God is faithful and I promise you He's bigger than any problem that you have in your life. So this takes me to the final section of Scripture in the New Testament that mentions Sarah. And I've already told you that it was in Hebrews chapter 11. Now before that, you've got ten chapters talking about why Jesus is better than anything else in all of creation and how that He has come to redeem mankind. And then after that, you get to fix your eyes on Jesus and we, in chapter 13, you get this holy brotherhood living that we're supposed to live. So they're stuck in chapter 11 are these examples from our past of how to live holy lives of faith, to live by faith. 
And like I told you, Sarah's there. But if you go back to Genesis chapter 15 to 20, whatever it is roughly, you'll see there's where Sarah's story is recorded. And what, did, what was Sarah's faith that you read? She heard God's promise, but she told her husband to go have a child through someone else. When God came to her and said, you will have a child, she laughed. When the child happened, then, oh, all that other things come into play that we took in our own hands before and thought we were doing the right things, fulfilling God's promises. It's not our place to fulfill God's promise. And she started having animosity towards the other mother and her child. I feel like it would have led to the first example probably from Hebrews where the brother killed his brother. Don't you think if God wouldn't have came and rescued the other mother away and sent her away and blessed her just the same, that Sarah would have wound up eventually killing Hagar or killing Ishmael? Don't take the problems into your own hands. Give them to God. Some problems are too big for you, but they're not too big for God. So Hebrews chapter 11 starts this way. It gives us a definition first. Now faith is the assurance of what we hope for and the certainty of what we do not see. Verse 2, I've got several different translations here. The NIV says this is what the ancients were commended for. The NLT says through their faith the people in days of old earned a good reputation. The English Standard Version it says, for, for by it the people of old received their commendation. The Berry and Study Bible says this is why the ancients were commended. The King James Version says, for, it, for by it the elders obtained a good report. You've got the definition of faith. And then you've got people, men and women, who were commended received a status, eldership. They did something because they had faith. This work did not save them by any means. But since they had faith, they acted and lived differently than the world around them. Why? So that they could proclaim God to the nations, to the world. But also because of God's promises and His faithfulness so that they could raise their children to be children of God. So that, ladies, you could help your husband stay focused as a man of God. Man, I can throw it around the other way, too. Because you have faith, you should live differently. Verse 3, By faith we understand the universe was for formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made of, out of what was visible. And now we start this list. By faith, Abel, who was killed by his brother, right? Offered, a, offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith he was commended as righteous when God gave approval to his gifts. And by faith he still speaks, even though he is dead. Now let me compare Sarah to that real quick. Sarah was headed down the path that Cain was headed down, not Abel, wasn't she? Then we have verse 5, By faith Enoch was taken up so that he did not see death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Now, we don't know much about him, but he lived in such a way that it pleased God so much that God took him away. Path A, Cain went down and killed his brother. But his brother still speaks today because we have eternal life through Jesus Christ. We should be going down the path of Enoch. That's where Sarah should have been headed. But at first we see that she's not because she lacks faith. Then we have verse 6, which defines it even further. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith saves you. Faith is how you are designed to live a holy life. Lord, please increase my faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who approaches Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. So mothers, I ask you again, whatever that thing is that you think is too big, to put it in context of this verse. God can handle 
God will handle all of those problems. If you don't know how, we're going to get up to Acts 1-8 here in a little bit because you're going to realize it's Ascension Day. And the, the, the apostles ask him, Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of heaven? And he says, It's not for you to know those things. It's for you to be my witness. Mothers, it's not for you to know how. It's for you to be a godly wife and a godly mother. And don't ever give up on that. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place, he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went. So we have the husband mentioned first. Without knowing where he was going, by faith he dwelt in the promised land as a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Because we know where he's going, that he's going to prepare a place for you, and he is coming back for us. Then the very next verse, we have Abraham's wife, the mother of Isaac, the promise of God. And by the way, Isaac means happy to almost mocking laughter. I believe that's right. I'm going to look at that right. Isaac's, the word Isaac means mocking laughter. Pretty, yep, see. Isn't that, isn't that funny? <laughs> he laughs. But it's meant in a, a, almost a mocking way, but a good way. You know, like, really? God can do this? He's that big? She was 90 years old? Wow. By faith, Sarah, even though she was barren and beyond proper age, was enabled to conceive a child because she considered him faithful who had promised. I don't know when her faith increased. I know that she was commended for her faith. I kind of take it back to the first miracle that's recorded where the servants had to go pour the water that became wine. And the way I read Scripture there is as they were pouring that in the master's ceremony of the cup, that's when it became wine. Because by faith they were obedient. They did what Jesus told them to do. By faith, even though she was barren and beyond the proper age, she was able to conceive a child because she considered him faithful who promised. And from one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the skies and as countless as the sand in the seashore, just as God promised. Lord, help me overcome my unbelief. Lord, increase my faith. Lord, help me to be the proper husband and the proper father and the pro proper example to even my enemies. And mothers, help. Lord, I'll say it this way since I'm not a mother. Lord, help you to be the wife that God has called you to be, the mother that he's called you to be. You have such an impact not only on your husband and your, uh, your children, but on the world, even if you're a stay-at-home mom. And God has given you the talents, abilities, and spiritual gifts that you need. Trust in Him. Put your faith in Him. And don't let anyone tell you any differently. We're going to pray and then have communion. Kim or Logan, if you'll put something on for communion, that would be great. I didn't tell you. I had the guys come up, like I said, last week. And I told them, I said, as we do this and think about this, think about leading your wives. Think about all the promises. Go back and study Scripture as though Jesus were opening up the Old Testament to you. And then go back.